Sorry. Sure, go ahead. No. Thank you for joining us today, everybody, for our brief update. Hopefully, we're going to give you some helpful information today in these times of uncertainty. And I would like to introduce our Dean of Admissions and Enrollment Management Services, Dr. Kevin Sprague. Uh, Dr. Sprague is a proud alum of Wayne State University School of Medicine and also an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sprague. Thank you, Jamie. And I'd like to welcome all the participants today. And um, you'll have an opportunity to meet the admissions team. And our goal is to assist you to be the, have the best application that you can put out. And hopefully, we are going to see you. The applications come in in July, and we're looking forward to seeing that. A little bit about Wayne. What the richness of Wayne is, is our class size. We have a class of 290, which gives us a great diverse student body with a lot of life experiences and backgrounds. It adds to the richness of the class. We're also the only single campus uh, medical school in Detroit and the largest medical single campus medical school in the country. We have opportunity to work with multiple healthcare systems. We have a very diverse patient population and facing the challenges of the social determinants of health. So all of these things add to the richness of our education at Wayne. And again, if we have any, any questions or concerns, we're here to help you be the best you can. So um, today you'll hear from Shabana Mohan from uh, Financial Aid, Abi Kushman, who is our assistant director, and Don Yargo, the supervisor. Thank you very much, Dr. Sprague. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar on Becoming a Warrior MD. Um, before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Um, so please select the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen um, and to ask any questions that you may have. Uh, if your questions have already been answered, uh, please use the upvote thumbs up feature uh, to get the question um, answered. Basically, it just moves it up the list so that we can kind of just take note of it and answer it in a, um, a more expeditious fashion. Um, questions are going to be taken mostly at the end of this presentation. Uh, panelists are going to be trying to answer as many of the questions that you pose as possible. Um, all the resources, of course, that we're going to be discussing and pro providing to you today um, will be sent out as well. All right, and to get started, uh, let's talk about Wayne State University School of Medicine. Uh, the core of our mission statement can really be distilled into three different categories, urban clinical excellence. So it's since 1868, we're the first and only medical school in Detroit and are very community driven. Uh, as indicative of our community-based learning experiences like Street Medicine Detroit or Antina's community project. Um, what's really novel at Wayne State is that our clinical experiences really begin at your first year. And they're really embellished with the 30 free health clinics that we also have in Detroit. Further, Wayne State University is also one of the last schools to use cadavers to teach anatomy, which is actually a really interesting um, teaching strategy. Finally, in terms of uh, excellence, we're also home to many um, of the world's first, including the first open heart surgery and the discovery of the first drug to also uh, treat AIDS. Um, and we're also one of the first schools to pioneer a plant-based nutrition curriculum and a COVID-19 specific curriculum as well. With over 80 student organizations and a match rate of about 97%, for the largest single campus medical school in the country, as Dr. Sprague just mentioned, uh, we believe becoming a Warrior MD is a great decision. So to kind of give you an idea about um, applying to medical school, um, what we wanted to do was give you a brief overview of the primary application. So using the AAMC experience, attributes, and metrics model image that you see on the right-hand side, we will begin by the core of the wheel, looking at academics. So strong preparation for taking the exams and assimilating content and knowledge is showcased by how well you perform on your MCAT and your GPA. So how you select letters of recommendation are also very important, uh, as you should identify faculty and non-faculty. Specifically, we ask for two letters from a faculty member and one letter from a non-faculty member. 
And these letters should really speak to um, your academic readiness, but it should also speak about your maturity, character, and resolve to wanting to become a successful medical student. Written materials are a great way to identify these facets, um, all of those facets uh, from your perspective. And the personal statement should highlight your journey to medical school and is also a really great way to highlight your diversity that you wish to bring to our medical school, as well as the personal attributes such as leadership, altruism, as well as grit and resilience. Similarly, the secondary essays is our way of really identifying why is it that you wanna to come to Wayne State University. So finally, um, experiences comments. Um, you're allowed the opportunity to describe experiences that you've had, as well as highlight three specific meaningful experiences, um, which strong candidates will be sure to select wisely as we do view them very strongly during our holistic admissions process. Now, to help you walk you through how COVID-19 has impacted our review of your application, I'm gonna hand off to Don Yarjo, our admissions supervisor. Nice to see you. Whoop, I'm muted, so hang on. Oh. oh, unmuted. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Don Yarjo. Sorry about the mute, but um, so first of all, we wanna talk just briefly just to let you know that we are trying to be as highly flexible as we possibly can during these COVID times. Um, as far as coursework um, for the prereq courses, we will accept online courses from other four-year colleges or universities, um, not necessarily your home institution. Um, we still prefer that students select courses to be graded as opposed to pass fail. This is for the prereqs. Um, particularly um, if that option is available to you. Um, we do know that the double AMC timelines have changed slightly. Um, the application transmission is delayed. We will not receive any applications. We will not know anyone who applies until at least July 10. That is when AMCAS will start releasing applications. The earliest we expect to send out a secondary would be July 13th. Um, there are no changes currently to the EDP deadline. Um, it says August 3rd, but technically it's August 1st for the application to be submitted to AMCAS. August 4th will be the last day that we can receive an MCAT score for early decision. So we have moved that back a couple days to allow for those later July scores to be released. Um, the overall AMCAS uh, deadline is not changing. It is still December 31st. Um, as far as the MCAT, we will be accepting MCATs that are currently offered by the AAMC in the calendar year 2020. Um, we do require MCAT scores as part of a completed application for eligibility for interview. In other words, we will review your application when it comes in your primary, um, even if it doesn't have an MCAT score. We will then um, request a secondary. Once a secondary is completed, we will wait until those MCAT scores come in before we will make a decision about an interview. We are still accepting MCATs from the calendar year 2017 to present. You can submit, we wanna reiterate, you can submit an application without having your MCAT on file yet. We are trying to be as flexible as we can in this whole process. So, um, the changes that we anticipate, um, we will be doing virtual interviews for the 2020-2021 admission cycle. Um, we, our interview process consists of one faculty interview, MMI interviews, and medical student interviews. Um, we are still working on that process um, so that we're not able to give you all the information about how that's gonna work but we do wanna let you know that they will be virtual interviews. Um, there are a lot of resources for preparation out there. Um, the AAMC, if you link to their website, 
There's virtual tips for applicants about how to prepare. Please go to your pre-health advisor. We spent time with them. We try to get online with them as often as we can to update them. Please reach out to them for any questions, particularly about the virtual interviews. And then also visit the MSAR, the Medical School Admissions Requirement. It's an absolutely wonderful resource for everyone to have at this time of the year. Shabana? Hello. Um, welcome. Thank you for attending this webinar. Um, I just wanted to briefly introduce you to uh, the financial aid process. Um, as you are considering Wayne State University, uh, we strongly recommend that you fill out the FAFSA. The website has changed if, you've, if this is something you've submitted um, online as an undergraduate student. Uh, so please take a note of that new um, website. Now, when you complete the FAFSA, you can list up to 10 schools every time you submit your FAFSA. So if you're applying at multiple institutions, we recommend that you uh, submit all of that information. Wayne State University does not require that you post, uh, that you list your parent information on your FAFSA. But if other schools require it and you've put that information on the FAFSA at Wayne State University. We don't look at that information. It does not penalize you in any way. Um, your FAFSA application will be available uh, for you to complete October 1st, 2020, if you are planning to enroll in July of 2021. Um, and we will send out award notifications um, after you have been admitted to the school and usually no earlier than uh, late March or April of 2021. All right, um, if you're interested in kind of getting an estimate of how much need-based um, scholarships you could be eligible for, uh, this is the matrix that we use. Um, it is also available on our website. Um, if you need to look back on your Pell eligibility that you've used or the subsidized loans that are on your history, you also would go to studentaid.gov. So this is the website that I was referring to. This is now the Department of Education's federal like dashboard for students. So this is where you would fill out your FAFSA. I apologize. This is the dashboard for the Department of Ed. This is where you would log in to look at your loan history, um, your federal Pell eligibility that you have used, as well as uh, fill out the FAFSA. So um, make sure you get access to this and um, it ha will have a lot of information. Next slide, please. Just as a heads up, you know, medical school is a huge financial investment, um, but also be aware that there are certain uh, expenses that financial aid cannot cover. So if you have any of these expenses that are listed on your, um, that you currently uh, listed in your budget, you kind of want to address those before you begin medical school, whether here or anywhere else, um, you know, to ensure, you know, your success financially. Sorry about that. Thanks, Shobana. Uh, this is an example and certainly not an expectation, but at Wayne State University, we're deeply committed to serving our community. And to that end, we've established several community advisory boards that seek to inform leading community members on how to disseminate information quickly and spearhead the charge on health literacy, which has led to greater adherence, lower recidivism, and the increased quality of care for the life um, and life for the citizens of Detroit. So suffice to say, there are numerous clubs and activities given the diverse interests of our medical students. But in short, commitment to our community and service is what our students are really steeped in. Thus, in response to COVID-19, um, Wayne State University's Physicians Group and the Access Group has partnered to help deliver care to our community partners via drive-through testing and mobile provisional testing, whose effectiveness has actually been noticed by the CDC and is currently being considered as a novel deployment strategy for our nation or national city centers across the United States. So with that, um, we just wanna say that, um, thank you so much for really 
joining us today. Um, we know that these are really uncertain times and we know that you have a lot of questions for us as well. And so what we'd like to really do at this point is just really take a lot of these types of questions that you've had for us. Um, we did review a few of uh, the questions that you may have sent us and they're actually pretty fantastic. So um, we'd like to take a few uh, live questions and a few of those that you've sent to us also. And I will switch over to Don Yarjo, who's gonna moderate our question and answer session. So Don, I think you're still unmuted. Okay. If you can all hear me now. So we had some questions that did come in uh, during the RSVP process. And I'm going to ask some of those questions. We're trying to answer as many of the questions through the answer chat page as we can. Um, so make sure that you're checking there. Um, Abby, we'll start with, uh, does the faculty have an open door policy and are they receptive to students looking for extra assistance outside of lectures? Yes, absolutely. So in this current climate, I mean, I think we all know that a lot of lectures are streamed. So students or faculty are really aware of that and actually are very eager to actually reach out to our students and truly encourage a lot of students to come and see them and have an open door policy. Uh, for aspiring pre-med students who have yet to take the necessary science prerequisites to apply to medical school, how will science classes that require lab be handled during the pandemic? So going forward this year, we've adjusted our prerequisite requirements for labs uh, to be strongly recommended. Um, in addition, we've also added that writing intensive courses may also be used to satisfy our English requirement too. So that should be uh, hopefully very helpful for a lot of schools that are not offering a lot of lab courses uh, for two semesters. All right. Um, Shibana, if you are able, I would like you to answer. Um, Mohammed is asking, has there been any changes in eligibility or availability of student loans or grants for Wayne State medical students um, in COVID-19 times? So at this time, um, you know, with the CARES Act, um, if you currently are in repayment or you currently have student loans, those loans are not accumulating any interest and you're not required to make any payments until September 30th. Um, of this year. However, as of right now, we don't have any, there's not been any changes as far as um, how you're applying, what you're eligible for, um, you know, moving forward, we pretty much expect to deliver, um, you know, the same amount of financial aid because the education is going to be, you know, on par. Um, Abby, how important is it to do research? I think it's really important to do research um, just because it's one facet of your application that you can use to really showcase how not just that you've matured but how you've actually developed analytical and critical thinking skills that's really required and oftentimes necessary in medical school so um, i believe we looked at it, it's about one eighth of your application but it's still a part of your application so we really want to make sure that you guys if you do have the opportunity to do research by all means do so um, is it a prerequisite to apply um, and is it required? No, it's not. And remember, we have a holistic admissions process, so we're looking at every facet of your application. But strong applicants are really gonna consider all of the opportunities available to them and make the decisions that's best, uh, that best fits their abilities and needs. And yeah, hopefully that answers that question. Um. So one of the questions Nora has was, would you explain the application release process? What is the difference between someone that submits on June 1st, for example, and someone that submits at the end of June before they are released to you in July? There is absolutely no difference. So AMCAS will um, take the applications along with the transcripts. It will take them anywhere from one week to six weeks to verify that application. During that process, um, the earliest they will release any application is going to be July 10th. So if an applicant submits an application on June 1st, an applicant submits an application on July 1st, if AMCAS 
has everything they need to verify and they're able to verify quickly, then that um, it will all, they will all be released on the same day. So um, applying on June 1st isn't necessarily an advantage. It's just depending on the time frame. Um, it has nothing to do with Wayne State. Um, it just is the way that AMCAS releases data to us. Um, Avi, um, how is student mental health and well-being prioritized? I think this is a fantastic question. Um, I think that especially given the times that we find ourselves in, I think it's really important for us, especially even us working in admissions and our staff members, to really um, understand and um, appreciate mental health, um, especially during this time. Now, Wayne State is very cognizant of this fact. We do offer multiple services and um, also availability for um, our counselors, um, our faculty members, as well as our staff members in regards to like how well to meander the course that's really in front of you for medical school. It truly is one of the hardest um, uh, obstacles you may have faced um, in your life. And you know, you have many things that do end up occurring in your life that helps you and provides you a skill set. But um, one thing that we're able to do at Wayne State is um, kind of assess that from, you know, various facets. Um, I believe a few, actually a few days ago, um, a few medical students actually launched a research project. Um, it's actually born from a project called Warrior Strong Together. Um, and it's a free Wayne State University uh, mental health intervention. And this is something that, you know, they've been providing to students, faculty members, um, as well as staff members about, um, you know, how to go about actually addressing mental health um, and prioritizing um, that over um, some of the other challenges that life may um, give to you. So that is the way that I believe mental health is really being recognized and prioritized at our university. And please understand that um, we still, even after we end this uh, webinar, we will continue to try to answer as many of the questions that are in the question and answer section. Um, and you will be getting access to it uh, within the next week or so um, that it will be released to you. So we just wanna make sure that you uh, recognize that we can't necessarily answer all of these questions online. So um, um, one last thing just to add, um, one thing that I wanna have everybody note also is that we're hosting a panel on COVID-19 wellness through our diversity and inclusion um, office tomorrow. And that's one example of how we actually end up, um, as I said, uh, prioritizing student mental health. And that's something that we encourage all students to um, partake in. Um, Dr. Sprague, how have successful candidates in the past demonstrated how they will resonate with WSU's mission statement? Thank you, Don. This is probably the most important aspect of the application. And each applicant needs to uh, read the mission statement of the schools they're applying to and demonstrate through their healthcare and extracurricular activities how they align with that mission and what their goals are in their future careers. So it's very important. So we look at it, we get that information from the personal statement as well as what's demonstrated in their um, activities, healthcare, extracurricular, and leadership activities. Abby, can you talk about ways students can get involved in community engagement, outreach, particularly as an M1 or an M2? Oh, absolutely. This is something that I really love. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to get involved. And one of the examples that I provided to everybody in our presentation was these drive-through mobile provisional centers. Um, Street Medicine Detroit is a great way. Um, a lot of free clinics around uh, the Metro Detroit area, I believe uh, there's about 30 of them that we currently are affiliated with. They're also really great opportunities. But I think one thing that I'd like to mention, which perhaps may even come up as a question soon, is right now with COVID, um, there's a lot of opportunities that um, kind of on the wayside when it comes to its avail their availability. So in this environment that we find ourselves in where opportunities may be attenuated and just not very many that you may um, find available, I think that you should really look at it as an opportunity to really take advantage of. I think that you could really delve into your creativity 
And the most amazing thing about Detroit is that it's almost to me a blank canvas. There's so much opportunity out there to really delve into community service, which is really what a lot of our M1s and M2s take advantage of. So one of the initiatives that um, they've gotten through is um, Auntie Nas Clinic um, and their ability to really uh, showcase um, to Auntie Na, who happened to be a really great pioneer in um, um, really taking care of her community. Um, what we've done is that we've actually partnered with her and developed a free uh, clinic in her um, neighborhood. And we've also developed a farm and subsistence um, a planning initiatives as well. And I think that um, opportunities like that are something to be taken advantage of. And that's something that's readily available to you as an M1 and an M2 student. Abby, yeah. for those who decide to take a gap year and obtain a master degree or complete a post back program, is it okay for them to ask those professors and advisors for letters of recommendation instead? Um, and can you also speak about whether or not um, a committee letter is acceptable? Yeah, we do accept committee letters. I'll begin there. Um, committee letters are acceptable. Um, we do ask that um, two of your letters are from a faculty member and one letter from a non-faculty member. And this is where, again, it comes back to um, your, uh, basically your best judgment, your professional judgment as a physician in training. I think that for you to decide who these people are, they're going to be writing letters to you is very important. I believe also that you identifying um, who these people are that know the most about you, that could speak to virtues that you've had in your journey to becoming a physician, I think are also really important. Um, so to answer the question more so on um, the gap year to obtain a master's degree or complete a post back program um, and to get letters from them, absolutely. I think that from a holistic perspective, if I can speak to that, I think that if you have um, in your pursuit of um, higher education, specifically medical education, have taken undergraduate courses as well as graduate courses, it's safe to say that you've learned a lot of things along the way, especially in your master's degree and post -bac program. So uh, if you are able to get um, a letter of recommendation from them, that is great. But it's also important to still remember what you've also learned in your undergraduate years as well. And that's also great too. Sorry, there are a lot of questions here, so I'm doing my best. I'll be a little more brief when it comes to my answer so we can get to a lot more of them. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead. Um, I think we answered that one. Um, So, Abby, I'm going to put this out there because I know that uh, students have a lot of questions about it. Um, I have looked at the WSU School of Medicine website for the curriculum, but it looks like it still needs to be updated. And I know it's difficult uh, for the admissions office to really discuss uh, curriculum. Um, is there a way that students can find out about our curriculum and what would that format be? So. Yes, I think that a lot of things are currently changing. I think everyone kind of understands that these are revolving and evolving times. Um, I think the best way for us to disseminate that type of information is to periodically, I would say, check our website. What we're planning on doing going forward is really putting up a document that kind of showcases to you on what exactly our curriculum is really looking like. The other facet that you can look into are um, more specifically um, there's a website that we have that we will also share in this presentation um, that is for our, uh, that's more specific to students that have actually matriculated. And it goes over more specifically what happens during year one, um, what exactly are courses such as like P4, where you're allowed to do, um, you know, as I said, like our nutrition based curriculum, and then also um, look at political advocacy. Um, so those different areas and how they actually correlate to um, having both a basic science and a clinical based curriculum and how we've kind of titrated that with uh, curriculum that we have currently, I think will be a little bit more um, well understood on that web page. So we'll share that um, once we end up sending materials to you. And I think that would be one of the best ways to begin learning a little bit more about our curriculum. Um, but another opportunity that we have is 
Uh, for those students that are from Wayne State, they may know this, but um, for those of you that are not, um, the Wayne State University School Bulletin actually lists all of the courses that are available to students for their M1 and their M2 years. So if you ever Google just basically Wayne State University School of Medicine course bulletin, it goes through all of the courses that you're going to be taking um, in your years one and your year two. So that's a really good opportunity for you to kind of understand, especially I'm seeing a lot of questions in regards to even pharmacology, um, how a lot of these courses actually integrate with the curriculum that we have and for how long you'll be taking them. So those would be two opportunities. One is us sending you actually a document, showcasing it also on our webpage. And number two, actually checking out our course bulletin that actually showcases all of the courses that we currently offer. Dr. Sprague, um, we have a question here. How do you guys view out of state applicants? Are you more or less likely to accept someone out of state who potentially has the same stats as someone in state? When we go through all the applications, um, the state status is not taken into consideration. So we look at each application holistically. And being that we're a very large class of 290, it's probably two thirds, one third, one third's out of state. So there is uh, each application is looked at the quality of the application, not the geographic area. Okay, um, Abby. So I think this is going to go back to um, submitting additional transcripts. But how does AMCAS calculate an incomplete on the transcript um, if a student receives a good grade for it afterward? If a student receives a good, yeah, I, I think that we're still in terms of, I assume. We're still in talks with the WNC in regards to how this is really going to be calculated when there is a grade that appears, um, how that's really going to be recalculated to the GPA is something that we're currently looking at. Um, one thing that we've put together is basically what our stipulations are when it comes to um, pass or fail curriculum. Um, and that's something that I think we're also in conversations with the AAMC in regards to how that's really going to change in this COVID environment. Um, for incomplete courses, um, if it does appear as an I, again, there's no grade associated, so there's not going to be a GPA reflection. However, if there is a subsequent grade and um, you end up actually looking into that following, um, so before your submission of your AMCAS application, but still at the point where you're um, um, verifying your transcripts with, the, with AMCAS, I believe your GPA can be uh, reconfigured. However, once you really push that submit button, it's difficult for you to reach out to AMCAS and actually say that, well, you know, I have an updated transcript for you to change. Please do so. Um, so if that is a possibility, that's the only way that you'll have a GPA reflection appear on your transcript that we'll see. But otherwise, a lot of this is more, um, um, I would say, AAMC associated. It depends on how well they actually take uh, or at what point they're going to actually take this and move forward. Don, do you have a comment about that? Yes, I can reiterate that once you submit your transcript to AMCAS and it is verified, um, unless there was an error on the part of your university, no additional coursework will be added to your application. So when you submit that transcript to AMCAS, that is the final transcript that will reflect any GPAs um, or coursework. Um, unless there was a, an error made in either the calculation of, you know, AMCAS verification, but that is all following AMCAS guidelines. It has nothing to do with Wayne. So do not submit that transcript until you're ready to have those grades counted, if that makes sense. And I suppose that's the uncertainty in my voice as well. It's just that with the current environment and the way things are going, um, things may change and that, that may change as well. So it's difficult to say one way or the other, but I would say it's safe to assume that they're not gonna change after you end up submitting them to AMCAS. Okay. Um, it looks like we've got about five more minutes to go. Um, we do like to keep things at, at a minimum amount of time. 
Um, we do have some answers or questions that we will be posting online that unfortunately our host is not able to do at this time. Um, so we're gonna try to figure out how we can get those all to you that we have already answered. Um, a question from Raja is, do you have to have all prereq coursework completed before applying, Avi? No, you don't. Okay. They can complete it during the process? Yes. And when does it have to be completed by? It, so this is actually a good opportunity. This has to be completed um, before you end up matriculating. So the July of the year, so every year in July, you'll be matriculating to our class. So this, uh, for this application cycle for 2020, you'll be matriculating with the class of 2021. So during the year of 2021, all prerequisites have to be completed before you actually matriculate, which means in winter of 2021, we expect to see you having a degree conferred um, and sent over to us. Now, that being said, um, I believe our stipulations for this coming application cycle are going to involve that um, you are going to have the ability to, by July 1st is going to be our deadline for those prerequisites to be completed, as well as a degree conferred. Um, and we will have the ability and the leeway through August in order to have those uh, actually sent over to us. But that's kind of like that fast deadline, that hard deadline. So if you please, um, I would say for your benefit, um, if you are unable to um, complete those prerequisites around that time, you may have to seek out deferral for one year following your acceptance. And just make note of that as you're kind of uh, creating your plan as to how you're gonna graduate and how you're gonna apply to medical school. Again, everyone, are, everyone here on this call our physicians in training. We expect you guys to really be um, viewing this um, from that perspective. So please take note of the fact that you do need to have these requirements completed before you end up matriculating the following July. But we are, um, it is acceptable for you to still apply to our school and get your letter of offer if you're still in the process of completing these prerequisite courses. Um, Abby, we have a lot of questions um, here about um, what a non-faculty letter of recommendation is. First of all, I'm going to ask that everyone um, please feel very comfortable communicating with your pre-health advisor. Um, that is somebody that can be very helpful in managing many of these questions. But uh, Abby, can you speak a little bit about non-faculty letters of recommendation? Yeah, sure. So the faculty letter of recommendation is somebody that, um, and, and I completely understand this question. Um, if you have a PhD and you are not affiliated with, let's say, a institution, is that acceptable for you to send us a letter of recommendation? Um, we look at the faculty letters as being affiliated with an institution. So these are, um, you know, just from the pure sense of the term, these are um, teachers that you've actually taken courses with in your, um, in your undergraduate and your graduate career. Uh, so you are likely you will be receiving letters of recommendation from those faculty members. Uh, can they be affiliated with other institutions or can they eventually leave an institution? Absolutely. So vis-a-vis -vis that concept, if there are certain faculty members um, or those that are from, um, that have a PhD or an MD, um, can you receive those letters from those um, individuals? Yes, on a case-by-case -case basis, but we strongly recommend that you end up taking these letters of recommendation from faculty members that you have taken courses with. Um, one, on like to sidebar with everyone, let's say that for instance, you were working in a research lab and unfortunately, um, or fortunately a lot of, um, you know, a lot of PIs are very involved with their research. And sometimes you don't always have a lot of face time with those individuals. If there is a situation by which you end up finding yourself in that situation, um, you can always have like one of your graduate assistants or your PhD students actually write the letter of recommendation from you. But again, it has to have been signed by somebody who is a faculty member or a PhD or an MD from your lab. So keep that in mind as well, because there, as, as I know um, from being through this process once that, um, it is sometimes difficult for you to get letters of recommendation, so keep that in mind. 
Um, this will be the last question and then um, we will make sure that we do our best to answer them all on the chat before we send them back to you. Um, are there minimum requirements for early decision? Avi? Yes, there are minimum requirements for early decision. 70th percentile MCAT score from your BCPM GPA and then we ask for a 3.70 GPA. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to Avi. That was our last question that we're gonna um, ask in this particular webinar um, and let Avi kind of close us out here. <laughs> thank you so much, Don. And thank you all um, for actually attending our event today. We hope that this has given you a little bit more information about how to become a Warrior MD. Um, we know that we weren't able to answer a lot of your questions today, but as I mentioned earlier in our presentation, we will be taking the materials and the recorded um, informational webinar and sending it to all participants that attended today. Um, if there are any follow-up questions, please note um, our email address, mdadmissions at wayne.edu. Feel free to reach out to us um, and we will end up responding back to your questions. Um, and we wish you really the best uh, during this application cycle. Again, we really want to stress that um, we are remaining flexible. We are being really understanding of really the, the trials and tribulations that you are all going through um, because we're also going through many of them as well. And uh, we are cognizant of that. And as uh, situations and developments arise, we will keep you informed of that. So please continue to reach out to your pre-health advisor. Um, look at our MSAR requirements as well because we're actively updating it as well as looking at our website. And again, feel free to reach out to us at any time in our email as well. And with that, we'd like to close the session today. Thank you guys so much for attending and take care.